podcast as uh, we are happy to bring you a recap of the Eastern semifinal and the Western semifinal today. Fun, fun Sunday of football. I just wanted to start off by saying uh, that I had such a great viewing experience of this game because I sat in the upper deck on the east side. Like there was three or four rows behind me until you fall out the stadium on the other side. I was that high up, which still isn't as high as the press box where you were watching. Uh, <laughs> but but I sat that high up on the east side, and it's the first time this entire season I've been to a CFL game that I haven't been working in some way, shape, or form, whether it's being uh, like uh, stuff for CFL.ca, uh, or if it, I mean, I was doing a video after the game, but it's like, it's after the game. You can do whatever you want during the game. So I was like, well, if I really want to get the true experience, I'm going to, my idea originally was to watch the game from a different location for each quarter. So I picked four spots in Tim Hortons Field where I was like, I want to go there, 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 and there. So the first quarter I watched from the Stipley because I wanted down low, low angle, end cut. I wanted to see the offensive line, defensive line play. And then I was like, okay, that was fine. But second quarter, I was like, I'm going to go to the top of the stadium on the east side. I went there. I never left Uh, because it was so good. Like, it was so much fun to see it from up high and to be able to assess, like, rotations on defense and the way that the receivers were running their routes and all the rest. So um, it was really, really fun. But the one thing I will say, because I, I very rarely, if ever, get to experience Tim Hortons Field as a fan, even as somebody who lives in Hamilton, it's just not a lot of events that I go to where I'm just going to hang out. And that one I did, and it reminded, I had a flashback to, do you remember Kyle? Because we're talking about soccer here off the top. When the Canadian national women's soccer team played against England, was that the first event at Tim Hortons Field? Ooh. uh, That was a long, way, way back. Like I feel like I had just left university. That was pre-Pan Am Games? I think so. I think so. But regardless, I, I remember going to that and going to buy a beer, and it took forever. And I And I remember thinking... Uh, whatever, it's fine. Like they're just opening the stadium. There's new people that are working here. Like they're figuring out their their workflow and all the rest. Yeah. This game, I w- I was frozen because I was sitting in the upper deck. The wind was whipping. The snow was coming. I mean, it was all sorts of different stuff. I mean, the puddles everywhere, and so your feet just get soaked and it gets into your bones and whatever. And also, I didn't wear my fleece lined pants. Ooh, what a mistake. What a, like why why do I buy fleece lined <laughs> pants three years ago to go to the Rockies? They are magical when you're in cold weather and I decide not to wear them when I I'm going to be sitting in the upper deck of Tim Hortons field on a snowy, wet, cold day. What an idiot I am. So you could have signed the press box. Uh, well, I, your, yeah, uh, no, your seat had your name on it. I, well, Kyle Scott from the CFL told me I had a seat and I said, I'm not going to watch him up there. And he's like, well, it's here if you need it. And I was like, well, I'm not going to use it. So like <laughs> and the reason for that honestly is not because I'm like, Oh, I don't want to be around the media people or I don't want to have conversations. I would be annoying as hell watching a game and it's not because i'm like screaming what are you doing or anything it's that i have this thing i don't know if i've ever said this before on this podcast or anywhere but i have this thing where i'm watching games where i i loved playing quarterback so much because of the mind games and the pre-snap stuff once the ball came up from the center i wasn't very good uh but before the ball came up i used to love reading out and trying to to get a sense for what defenses were doing and then trends and then where are certain personnel, where are they rolling their coverage, and where's the blitz coming from, and how are we directing uh, protection schemes and all that stuff. It, to me, it was the fun part of playing quarterback. So when I sit up high and I watch a game by myself, I'm muttering out loud under my breath the same way that I used to when I was standing in the shotgun, where I would be like, okay, Sam Lime. And it's not like I'm some sort of savant. It's just that I, yeah. I had to talk these things out to myself when I was playing quarterback. Because if I didn't talk them out and process them, I wouldn't be able to figure out what teams were doing. So I would break the huddle, you know, let's go gun ace right, 60 levels win. Break the huddle, go stand at the line of scrimmage. And before I would start my cadence, I'd be like, four down, middle linebacker, safety's over. Okay, I'm going to play the field. Like, I would just talk to myself that way. So I do that when I'm sitting in the stands watching the game where I'm like, I'm like, tie cats are four to the field halfback didn't roll oh they got numbers they're four on three masoli's got to play the field here oh look brandon banks touchdown and it's like that's the stuff that i like (laughs) doing because i'm trying to figure out okay i have the better view of the field than masoli does but i can see something developing here that like he's going to take advantage of this and and i and i just don't want to be sitting in the press box under my breath going cover two cover two i think it's cover two they're probably going to go it's like nobody wants to hear that so anyways i watch the game from up there and uh, i go down to get a coffee because i'm freezing at halftime kyle i went to get a coffee at 
first of all, they only have one size of coffee, which I don't know why that is. And they also didn't ask me if I wanted milk or sugar. I was like, can I have two coffees? And they're like, sure. And they just like poured me coffee and were like, here you go. I was like, mm, okay. Uh, which I thought was kind of funny because they're just like, it's like so Hamilton, right? To just go one size fits all. You'll have it black. I was, <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm sorry. Like, I didn't realize that I was going to ask for that. But um, I went down at halftime, used the washroom, uh, and then go to stand in line to get my coffee. I got in line with 10 minutes left in halftime. I got to my seat with seven minutes left in the third quarter for coffee. There were five people in front of me. It wasn't like a oh. 50 person line. They, I tweeted yesterday, they need the dude from Bar Rescue to come fix the Tim Hortons <laughs> concessions. John Taffer. They need John Taffer to come fix the concession speed. At Tim Should have came up to the press box to uh, get well, it was coffee. The other side. Go... I, was on, I was on the east. Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah, so I just decided to stay over there. And uh, Anyways, I, it got to the point where I, it was taking so long. I was like, you know what? I'm just interested how long this is actually going to take. So I'm just going to wait this out. Like I, At this point, I'm like, I'm here. I'm invested. So let's just find out how, how ridiculous this actually gets. And uh, in my first thought was wow this reminds me of trying to get that beer at the women's soccer match between england and canada way back when my second thought was oh man the great cup is coming i'm like if if this is the way this is going to work at great cup i'm like i I felt the need to basically like psa tell people if you're gonna go get something i wasn't even getting like warm food i wasn't getting beers i wasn't they had a coffee machine behind the desk and there were so many people off uh, ordering coffees that they were changing out filters like coffee filters and sliding, the, <laughs> sliding them in and like pouring the stuff onto, pressing the button, having it preheat. I'm like, you guys have got to crank this up times 10 because that's people are not going to pay several hundred dollars for a great cup ticket and miss half a quarter of the game or half the halftime show with the Arkells because they're waiting for their coffee to brew. I'm like, have that bleep figured out, man. Like you got two <laughs> weeks, figure that stuff out because that is ridiculous and people are going to be pissed if that happens um yeah i'm uh, i'm i apologize on behalf of uh, the tim hortons fee of uh, concession people <laughs> why you you don't have to apologize it's not on you i just i felt the need to get that out in front of everybody so uh anyways uh how was your uh, how was your viewing experience like how was the the mood in the press box throughout the game um as the game moved along in the second half i think there was this especially from the you know the ticat staff um there was an antsy feeling because I felt it was following the script of so many home games that we've seen this year. Toronto game, Hamilton gets a lead fourth quarter comes the defense. It seems is on the field, the entire, you know, the entire game. And then they blow it at the end. Um, And then the Montreal game was the same story. Yeah. I'm talking about in the regular season. And then that game yesterday, you know, it's funny because Ticats get the win. Now you're in the East final. You're going to have to play so much better if you're oh, yeah. Hamilton to beat the Argos. Now you're going against a team that hasn't lost at home this year. Or actually, they did lose at home, right? They lost against Edmonton at the end yeah, of the season. The game at the, the Tuesday game, they lost. At, yeah. I mean, they should have lost to the Ticats if Domagal hits the extra point. They should have lost to BC when they choked away the game with poor clock management at the end. And then... Um, what's his name? Jimmy Camacho. Camacho. Thank you. Uh, it misses <laughs> three field goals in five minutes at the end of that one in week 13 or 12, I think it was. So they should have lost. I don't think they're untouchable, but I agree with you. But specifically, I just feel like they have to play better offensively. Like I don't have a lot yeah. of, I don't have a lot of problems with the defense or special teams, but that the offense, the production is, uh, is pretty sporadic. And even when they're well balanced, <laughs> Like there was nobody on the tie cats yesterday who had more than five catches. Uh, poor Steven Dunbar had four targets and zero catches in the game, which I, I felt for him. But I also was told by somebody that he looked miserable and freezing cold on the sideline. I'm like, maybe don't take Steven Dunbar in fantasy. Now that it's late the season, he doesn't seem to be a cold weather guy. Okay. Just no. a little, little tip for everybody out there. Tim white looks like he is though. So that's good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I just, I, I, they have balance. But it's because I think they don't have anybody who's, including Brandon Banks right now, who's jumping off the page at you like Gino Lewis did in this game or like Kenny mm-hmm. Lawler's likely going to in the Western final. You know, it's, it's, it's funny. You mentioned that word, you know, balance. And are the Ticats balanced? 
or are they just not executing? That's a um, fair question. Yeah. yeah. Is it because uh, you like your balance? What did Don Jackson have? Less than four yards per carry. Yeah. Like the, they weren't running the ball fantastic either. Um, if you look at the stats and you didn't show somebody the score, somebody's like, oh, yeah, Montreal, Montreal yeah. definitely won the game wasn't the case right and it wasn't the case because of hamilton's defense you know for jeremiah masoli was it the the first three four drives he had fantastic field position and no points on the board Mm -hmm. and you know no points on the board until you know the big julian hauser uh play (laughs) where you know he recovers the fumble then you know runs it back um the ticats defensive line i thought was fantastic in the game and it, it was funny because at the beginning of the season, I even asked you on, on, on this show about Ted Laurent and what he was doing this season. And I thought Ted had a little bit more, you know, a little bit more quickness off the line this year than I saw even in 2019. Um, but then the second half of the season happened and I'm like, hmm, Teddy's not really putting up the production that he's been putting up, you know, on a regular basis for Hamilton for so many years. He showed up yesterday. I thought he was fantastic. Him, Dylan Wynn, Ja'Garrett Davis, obviously, Julian Hauser. Those four guys just got after it. And it was funny because coming into the game, you know, in my article on CF Perspective, we all talked about the protection of the Tie Cats and it being maybe a shaky spot because the Alouettes did lead the CFL in sacks this year. And again, maybe that comes with four matchups against the Ottawa Red Blacks during the season. Um, but the, the issue in the game and the deciding factor in the game was the protection of the Alouettes. I just never saw that coming where Montreal just, especially in that first half, just could not protect at all. So, you know, moving forward now for Hamilton, you're going to need a repeat performance against Toronto and get after McLeod Bethel Thompson if you're going to want to keep that game close and eventually hopefully take it. The thing I found surprising was not that Hamilton's defensive line was good. It was that on Montreal's defensive line, it was like, did Woody Barron play? Yeah. Did Jamal Davis do anything more than jump offside and make one tackle for loss? I think David I think Menard, like, like yeah, all those guys were quiet. It was weird. Like, it, and it, I guess it's a credit to the Ticats offensive line and maybe to the strategy and the system that they put in place. The the one there's actually two things that jumped out to me about being there in person not watching on TV, which in person is always better. And I always, I'm always amazed by people that go to games and I get it. There's not, everybody's not there to study the game the way that I like to. A lot of people just go because they want to have beers and hang out with their friends. That's totally cool. But if you're paying money to be in person, I'm always amazed when people don't watch the field or the sidelines during the non playing moments. Cause you learn a lot. Like, you, yeah. you, you get a real sense for the game when you just don't take your eyes off the field. And two things jumped out. One was Chris Van Zyl was in a constant conversation with the entire Alouette's defensive line. Like, <laughs> never ending. Every commercial break. And I know Chris pretty well. And I say this out of love and respect for him. And he would never deny this if I said it to his face. Chris is a world-class shit talker. Yeah. Like, world-class. Like, under your skin, dig at you like you remember when chris edwards in 2000 i want to say 18 yeah was, i remember was little yeah, chris was, he was new to the cfl <laughs> he was playing in edmonton this is now chris edwards that plays for the argonauts he was new to the cfl he was playing in edmonton and mic'd up was chris van Zyl, and you and i got such a kick out of it because you <laughs> you highlighted it you found it and you clipped it i think it brought it into the radio station yeah. and played it and it was him saying to chris edwards i don't even know who you are like turn around i C. What is C. Edwards? I don't know who you. And he just kept saying, "I don't know who you are." And he's like, "J.C. Sherritt was still middle linebacker at that time for Edmonton." He's like, "J.C., who's this guy?" He's like, "That's Chris." He's like, "Oh, I'm gonna call him Little Chris." <laughs> and then the rest of the game, he's just like, "Hey, Little Chris!" Like every time he would block him, he would throw him around, and call him Little Chris. Just so demeaning, but like so under your skin. And I could tell there was a great sequence during a television timeout where Chris Van Zyl was pointing at a couple of guys and wagging his finger at them. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I would love to hear what he's saying. But I know exactly what he's saying. He's just yeah. he's getting under their skin. And then the very next play, Jamal Davis, their super freaky athletic defensive end, jumps offside. And the first person to point at him and celebrate and laugh is Chris Van Sile. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it's what he does. He's a great veteran. He's a great offensive lineman. But he adds that to you. And when they get turnovers in this game, 
the first person sprinting off the sideline to go congratulate the defender who got the turnover is Chris Van Zyl. I'm like, that's culture stuff. Like that stuff actually yeah. matters and is really cool to see. Yeah, it, it definitely is. Um, you know, I thought Chris Van Zyl was, you know, fantastic in the game. Um, as for the Ticats offensive line, I was talking to somebody from the Ticats staff and, during the week, Jordan Murray, their left tackle, got banged up. So that's why uh, Vaughn Call stepped in. Um, now, Vaughn Call has been banged up a little bit for over the last little while. So I just thought, because I'm not a practice, I just thought it was a straight swap because Vaughn Call's better. Because that's what I thought. Well, you called I, for him last week on the show here. You said Vaughn Call's got to come back in. Yeah, I said, of all the guys that have played left tackle this year, I think Vaughn Call is easily the best left tackle they have. And the staff member for the Tag Cats was telling me, you know, Jordan Murray, he, you know, he's a mountain of a man. I'm like, yeah, but he's a little stiff. Uh, just I've seen guys just blow past him. And I think Fort Calls, you know, a lot better. And, you know, to see what he did on the field yesterday against a very good Montreal defensive line and all those guys as well. Right. Um, by the way, how weird as hell was it to see uh, Brandon Revenberg jump offside? I'm like, is that oh, the first time Rev has yeah. jumped offside in Hamilton? <laughs> I, I'm telling you, if I've covered, well, I mean, with the exception of this year, I, I've covered every single game on radio for the Thai Cats. I don't think I can remember one off the top of my head of him just like coming out of a stance and being like, and everybody's like, no, the play hasn't started yet. (laughs) Really weird. I was shocked. I did like, though, the Ticats at one point, there was a throwaway by Masoli, but the defense was offside. Um, And it was like a, it was a hard count, but it was obvious that they have been coached that if they center sees somebody jump just to snap it. So yeah. Masoli wasn't ready for it. And I'm like, oh, bleep, this is going to be bad because he gets the ball. There's no protection. And then I was like, oh, no, they were they, they were coached to do that because the flag came up and he saw it. And they were trying to get a free play, throw it away, whatever. And it wipes out the play. You move forward with the uh, with the penalty yardage. But uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, actually, about being at the game in person and watching the field during commercial breaks is that Trevor Harris was trying really, really hard to make his guys believe. and. Um, and one of the times that I saw this was during a break, about to come out of the break, our old boss, Mike Neighbors, who's just the greatest as a stadium PA announcer, he's screaming, all right, let's welcome back your Ticats defense. And all the Ticats defenders are going, yeah, give me noise, give me noise, give me – they're waving like this. Trevor Harris stepped out of the huddle and started doing the same thing like, yeah, I don't give a damn. Make it loud. Like, <laughs> like make it crazy and hearing all the rest. And it, it, to me, again, I'm just like reading into the psychology of that. That was him with an offense that was struggling with William Stanback not being around, maybe firing himself up. But I really think that was him basically saying to that huddle, hey, guys, it doesn't matter what's happening here. It doesn't matter that we're on the road. It doesn't matter yeah. what the score is right now. They can throw everything they want at us. Let's go find a way. Now, obviously, they didn't. But I thought it was admirable for him to take a little moment like that. Because Trevor doesn't do things like that that are not calculated. Like, he's not stepping out to to be silly or to just be, like, you know, doing something random. Like, he, he very, whether he realized it in the moment or not, he was sending a message to his huddle. And, uh, and I thought that was kind of an interesting read-between-the-lines moment of his relationship with this team. And then his comment after the game saying... Uh, that Kahari Jones, he can't thank him enough for being a leader of men and the organization in Montreal for uh, welcoming him in and taking a shot on him and, and giving him a chance and all the rest. I just, it seems like he really appreciates this roster, but you also get the sense that he is already kind of in like campaigning mode for, hey, do you guys like want to, you want to keep me around? Or? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know what Montreal is going to do moving forward with their quarterback situation. That'll be interesting to see. Does Trevor Harris uh, become the the backup to Vernon Adams Jr. or do they have a training camp battle? Um, but if they're going to have a training camp battle, that means you're going to have you know those two guys there that season because it's not like oh you're bringing in you know Trevor Harris on a whim to try over a you know training camp spot and then he wins or loses the quarterback battle and now he's just sitting there as as a backup quarterback. Um, but maybe that's what he is uh, at this point in his career. I didn't think he was fantastic yesterday. I also think, you know, if you substitute Vernon Adams Jr. into that game, maybe it goes a lot differently um, because Vernon Adams Jr. has the ability to avoid pressure. And maybe Trevor Harris, I thought he, of all the criticisms I have of, you know, Trevor Harris yesterday, his inability to find space out of the pocket 
right? Like I thought there were times where he could have stepped up in the pocket, ran towards the line of scrimmage, even ran for, you know, first downs and he didn't, he did the thing that I always criticize Jeremiah for. He kind of floated, um, and you know, throws the ball or holds on to the ball a little bit too long. And then the pressure gets home and it's like, you know, you have to realize the the context and the, you know the the importance of the situation, and that is, we cannot take sacks because you take sacks in the CFL, you're not getting first downs. It's simple as that, right? Uh, it, yeah, and and I think part of that, like you were talking about earlier with the box score, if you just hand it to somebody and you said, okay, who won this football game? They would obviously say Montreal, but it's deceiving because yards per rush, yeah, um, you know, yards passing, first downs, first down efficiency, quarterback efficiency, like all of these things, you're gonna go. Montreal, 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 Montreal. And then it's going to be six sacks, three, four turnovers. And it's going to be like, oh, okay, that was the difference in the game. Like, And that's where they actually were able to make their money on defense. And that certainly is more than just a stat. Like that impacted the way that Trevor was playing because you're right. He wasn't stepping up because he didn't have any confidence if he stepped up that he'd find somebody. So he was just backpedaling, backpedaling, backpedaling. There was a couple of times where he stepped up and ran through the pocket and, and got a little tiny chunk of gain. But um, the one that Simone Lawrence made the tackle on, I thought was really good. But I also a hell of a play by Simone. <laughs> but I also laughed sitting in the upper deck because I watched the replay and I was like, "Wow, Trevor is running like the Monopoly man." <laughs> like, he was just like skirting his feet along the ground. I'm like, he did not look very athletic on that run. But again, on a football field full of yeah. athletic freaks, it's it's easy for a quarterback to not look like he's uh, running at top speed. As for Hamilton's defense before the game, obviously Siante Evans. It's announced he was a game time decision on the depth chart. Um, you know, the, the day before he tries to make it a go in the pregame and somebody from the Ticat staff told me he just, he was kind of distraught. He just couldn't, he just couldn't do it. He didn't have any, you know, thing in his legs and, you know, it's, it's tough because, you know, that guy came to Hamilton with a chance to win a great cup and he wants to be on the field, especially in a playoff game. And now he's can't play but um, against his old team, right? Montreal. Yeah. And against his old team. So. He's out, and now I'm thinking, oh, crap, what the Ticats are going to do in the defensive backfield here. And they did what I thought they were going to do. Tunde Adelike to halfback, um, and then you know Stavros Katsantonis starts at safety. I was happy for Stavros because I'm yeah. like, this is a huge opportunity. This is also a crazy load of pressure. By the way, oh, bleeping Canada. Like, those guys were unbelievable. I thought those two guys in the secondary were the yeah. best guys in the secondary for the Ticats. Tunde was running around, making plays. He had that huge third down stop, um, you know, in the corner uh, at the pylon. And he just was unbelievable. That's what versatility is, right? A guy who's a Canadian safety that can step into, you know, the the that side on the field, the wide side of the field, and just make plays over and over again. And I thought Stavros was was great. I thought he, you know, I think that there was a little bit kind of a shaky moment at the beginning of the game. And then after that, he was just running downhill, making tackles, making plays. And then, you know, I talked earlier about, you know, Ted Laron. And then there was one point in the second half, um, you know, Desmond Lawrence gets banged up, I think, with that shoulder problem. He, can't, he eventually came back. Um, and now I'm thinking, oh, this is not good now, especially the Ticats were kind of reeling at that point. And it looked like Montreal was slowly creeping their way back into the game. He goes down and I'm like, OK, what are they going to do here? Nick Cam Cross. Kelly, Sam linebacker to corner. They put him at corner and here comes Nick Cross. And I'm yeah. like, this is the Ticats got two rookies starting on defense right now. <laughs> yeah, two Canadian rookies starting at important positions at Sam and free safety. But and, like, Tunde has played Sam a little bit as well. Like, when Cam Kelly got ejected, I think, earlier this year for the spitting instant in, uh, I think, the Edmonton game late in the year, then then Tunde played the whole second half at, at Sam linebacker. So he's played Sam, free safety. He's played, I mean, half back to the field. So he's got a he's got a really, really cool, fun skill set. But he also led the game in tackles. And the reason for that is twofold. One, he was playing at a high level, rallying to every single play and just flying around. But also, they were going after him in the passing game. Like, they decided, because usually your free safety is not your best cover guy. Because if he was a great yeah. cover guy, he wouldn't be a safety. And, and it's like, there's a difference between being rangy and playing the ball well in the air. And I think there was even a play in the 2019 Grey Cup where Tunde didn't play the ball great in the air. And I think that it's not a, it's not a weakness, I would say, but it's not his greatest strength, which is why I think he's a safety and not a, playing a different position. But if they're going to complete passes on him around him that dude's 
fast. Yeah. So he's going to get there and he's going to make the tackle because he's pretty physical too for his size. And, uh, and so, yeah, I thought that was really fun to see those two. And for Stavros, when you mentioned him getting into a, you know, a big moment and a lot of pressure, my first thought was, man, this is a long way from hosting a YouTube live show of the uh, CFL draft. I was like, cause I remember him like covering the draft on his own YouTube page and going live and carrying it for American viewers. Cause he had like a VPN where he could get like TSN onto YouTube and all. And I'm like, and now he's the starting free safety in an Eastern yeah. semifinal in a playoff game. And he, again, just like he did at UBC though, he's rangy. Yeah. He gets in on everything. He's not afraid to try and punch the ball out, whether it's in the air, getting to a receiver or whether somebody's carrying it. Like he's, He's a he's just feisty. Like that's the word that comes to mind for me. It's just feisty. And he was the third safety on the depth chart coming into the season, right? Yeah. You had Tunde, you had Mike Daly, and then Daly and early in the season gets banged up. And Stavros has made so much of his opportunity uh, this year, and Nick Cross as well, right? Nick Cross has been unbelievable on special teams. But you know, I was talking with Ticats fans on Twitter before the game, and you know, somebody had mentioned, you know, if somebody were to get banged up what would happen and I didn't think they would put cross on the field I thought Ty Beverett the backup Sam linebacker to Simone would go play Sam or backup Will linebacker uh to to you know Simone would go play Sam and then they would move Cam Kelly into that defensive backfield um and just to not put so much pressure on Nick Cross, but they didn't even hesitate. Nick Cross was the first person out on the field when Desmond Lawrence got banged up. And I'm like, okay, they're going to ride with, with these Canadians. <laughs> and I, you know, you look at what happened in the game because, you know, Seante Evans didn't play all of a sudden you get a bonus Canadian starter uh, on the field because Stavros is now starting and, you know, you have two Canadian defensive back uh, in the defensive backfield. And then, you know, you look at, you know, how the game transpired and I just thought the guys, that's why the draft is important, yeah. right? And, you know, credit to, you know, Drew Alleman because I know the work that he puts in, you know, scouting guys and making sure he hits, you know, on a lot of his draft picks and to have depth at, uh, you know, Canadian positions um, is important. And, you know, it was another you know testament to him um, that game yesterday. For sure. Uh, I just want to say this before we move on from the Eastern semifinal and talk about the Western semifinal, whatever the hell that thing was that came after the Ticats and the Alouettes. <laughs> uh, I got a text from my buddy Scott, who was sitting in down low in the in the lower bowl during this game at 1.33 p.m. yesterday afternoon, okay, half an hour after kickoff. And so th this puts it at probably end of the first quarter, start of the second, somewhere in there. Jeremiah hasn't looked great as of yet. There's been a couple of two and outs. The first time Jeremiah goes two and out in the first quarter, everybody around me in the Stipley starts yelling, where's Dane? Where's Dane? And then I get this text from my friend Scott who says, and he's not even sitting in the same part of the stadium as me. He says, dude, this two quarterback situation is so toxic for the fan base. It's amazing. <laughs> and I texted back and I said, I know, right? I just got the same sense. And it's like, you can kind of tell that some people are being sarcastic about it because they just think it's funny to like constantly hold it over Jeremiah's head. Like, hey, hey don't, don't mess up. Don't yeah. mess up because Dane's there. And there's some people who genuinely believe it. Like there's some people who every, <laughs> every single time Jeremiah throws an incompletion, they're like, that's it. I'm done with him. And they're just like ready to be like off with his head and just move on to Dane. And I'm like, I'm like, you're allowed to have incompletions. It's okay. Like, yeah. Just the, the big picture here is, yeah, Dane's probably going to be the guy down the road. But this is the first time that we've come out of a Ticats game and not needed to have that conversation. And why? It's because, and man, I got to tell you, if people have the ability to go back and rewatch Orlando Steinauer's media availability from post game yesterday, dude was preaching for just like straight 10 minutes. Everything he said, I just felt like being like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm mm mm, -hmm, mm, -hmm, mm, -hmm, mm, -hmm, mm -hmm. Cause he was just speaking truth on truth on truth on truth. And somebody asked at one point about the quarterback spot. And he said, it's about riding the ups and the downs and trusting that at the end of the game, you're gonna come out on top because you you know the people that are in your huddle and you trust them. And he's like, I trust Jeremiah. So I, it's why I, I'm not impatient with him uh, in that spot. By the way, also yeah. Herb Zerkowski in that post game media. I know he's just doing his job, but Herb asked Kari Jones, "Kari, do you do you feel 
like you're secure in your job here in Montreal after two first round losses in the last two CFL seasons. Yeah. Kari just laughed. He's like, yeah, I don't think about my employment status. He's like, I have a contract for next year and I'm <laughs> pretty sure they want me back. So man. Uh, okay. So one thing I do have to mention, it has nothing really to do with the CFL. Yeah. You mentioned earlier what the feeling in the press box was. It was a normal game. Uh, the, you know, the people from Montreal, there were a lot of them uh, in the press box. <laughs> They were, you know, a little antsy early on because the Alouettes were struggling so much. And then I don't know when it happened. I think it was some point early in the second half. News comes in from the wire. Mark Bergevin, general manager of the Montreal <laughs> Canadiens, got fired. I did The mood changed for all those people from Montreal. Herb Zerkowski stands up and he's sitting so far from me in the press box and i have a bunch of writers from montreal sitting right next to me and alouette staff members sitting right next to me and he just looks down and he just goes only montreal canadians can ruin my sunday because now those guys articles probably just got shrunk right. because of space on the newspaper and i know there was another guy that now had to write two articles and write about his reaction to the Mark Bergevin firing. And it's like the, the, the only the Montreal Canadians could, you know, just kibosh the Alouettes well, and now they didn't win, but you just take all the headlines away from the CFL all the damn time. As a general rule, if any team in the CFL is trying to do anything of importance, uh, the NHL will break a headline uh, as, <laughs> as seen by Mark Tressman and Jim pop being hired. And then all of a sudden the Leafs are like Babcock. He was like, Oh, yeah. sure, okay. Sure, sure. <laughs> Thanks guys. Appreciate it. Maybe you have like a little MLSE synergy. Maybe we can figure out how to time these things though. But um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it, I didn't connect those dots. So I'm glad that you did because that would have had a very real impact on it. Also, it feels like you're talking about a different time when you say their articles must have shrunk in the newspaper. Like in the in the hard copy of the newspaper, because I'm like, so it is. I'm like, isn't everything online at this point, kind of? But uh, uh, I mean, Montreal is one of the few markets that seems to still value the written word being printed on a piece of paper and then distributed across your city for you to pick up while you have a uh, a coffee in the morning. Like this, <laughs> there's not a lot of places that that still do a lot of that. It's all journalism has been pushed in a weird direction where it's like. When you have three, four yeah. writers covering the same team showing up, it's like, don't you guys get like the Canadian press feed? Like, don't you, you guys get the, it's like, yeah, but it's not the same story, obviously, as you're going to get from your Montreal no. writers talking about a Montreal story instead of just the big picture. And I'm like, I wish every city, every team had writers that would travel and cover it like that. But that's that era, I think, is gone and is probably not coming back. And Montreal is holding on for dear life. And I salute to those <laughs> Montreal writers for holding on tight. <laughs> By the way, I kind of knew something was coming down the down the line for the Montreal Canadiens because uh, Scott Mellenby, who obviously was in the front office of the Canadiens, he quit on Saturday. And I was like, huh, that's weird. Why would he quit? I'm like, Bergevin's on the hot seat. If he gets fired, there's a very good chance Scott Mellenby might be the general manager of the Montreal Canadiens. Apparently, he got word that, no, everybody was getting fired. Oh. <laughs> like, everybody in the front office was going to go including Mel and B and Mel and B is like, Oh, screw this. I'm going to jump off the ship before they push me. <laughs> so weird. Uh, so uh, there's that, um, you know, back awesome. to, you know, the Ticats Alouettes game, you brought up the quarterback situation and the fan base's reaction to, you know, every Jeremiah throw. There's been nobody in the media been more critical of Jeremiah than probably me. Right. I've said numerous times, I think Dane Evans should be the starting quarterback. Not now. I mean, it's it's the playoffs. It'd be so unfair to to throw Dane in there when he hasn't started a game in so long. Um, I look, it's pointless to talk about at this point. Yeah, I agree. Right, like Dane Evans is not going to play quarterback for the Ticats for the rest of the season. I mean, he might if Jeremiah struggles, you know, in the Toronto game. But let's be honest, he struggled in the Montreal game and. You know, the Tigers didn't even wait, like didn't even flinch in terms of putting Dane in the game. So that it, it, you're just going to drive yourself insane trying to make up this, you know, oh, get Dane in the game over Jeremiah. It's not happening. Right. So just enjoy the football game at this point and, you know, hope Jeremiah gets the job done. 
Um, I thought there was points in the game where Jeremiah looked really good yesterday. And then I thought there were points, and you mentioned it off the top, consistency to the Ticats offense. What was it? 20 of their 23 points came in the second quarter. And then in the second half, I put out a tweet later in the game. I'm like, are the Ticats going to go the entire second half and win the game without scoring? Um, you know, in the second half of this game. And, you know, at the end of the day, they, you know, got that field goal at the end. Um, but yeah, for, for the offense, you know, consistency is an issue and that defense is going to, you're going to put so much pressure on that defense, but here's the thing. It's been that way all season long. Like Jeremiah hasn't really had to, you know, put in a massive offensive performance to get a win in a close game. Um, Maybe that's going to change in Toronto. We saw the last time he went to BMO. Didn't go well for Hamilton. We'll, we'll see if that changes. I will say this for a guy from Northern California to see the way that Jeremiah Masoli in weather that, I mean, if you were in the crowd and you you say that your your hands were not freezing cold, uh, you're lying. Like, that was that was really cold. That was wet. Yeah. That was damp. All the rest. The ball snapped out of his hand on target a couple of times in a way that I was like, I don't know how he has that much grip on the football because the ball is hard and the ball is slick and wet and whatever. And I mean, they, they doctor the ball up however they want in terms of feel to be able to, to uh, I guess, make the quarterbacks happy. But I, I was amazed how sometimes he'd be like rolling to his left and he would just like across his body, bang, and like, to have that whippiness on your wrist and your your basically from your elbow down in bad weather is terrifying to me because you can go like this to to rip it out and it can just pop out of your hand and go a different direction. It's why you yeah. see quarterbacks a lot of the time like two hands back and only going forward in bad conditions. But Jeremiah didn't do that. So for a dude that has played in the places that he's played to have that control of the football in cold, wet, nasty snow, I, I was pretty impressed by that. And that gave, I think, a lot of Ticats fans seeing his comfort throwing the ball if you were paying attention hope for the remainder of the playoffs because it's not going to get any nicer folks like it's yeah. december in two days for ticats fans heading down to bmo for the for the east final it doesn't help the situation when you're you know all in the stands and you're close to the bench and you are yelling for dane and i don't think it affects jeremiah because i don't think that's jeremiah's you know mindset um he's so focused in on the game he just all that stuff is just noise um but again you know for the health of the fan base <laughs> Dane Evans is the guy, I think, moving forward for right now, it's Jeremiah Masoli. So you're going to ride it out as you know, far as he can take the tie cats. Um, and I thought, you know, there were points in the game where he played well. And, and especially at the beginning of the game, I was I was worried because the the first couple of drives he came out, he missed on a couple of throws. And I'm like, oh, boy, this is this might not go very well. Um, but thanks to the defense, you were able to get the ball in great field positions, uh, you know, at times. And another thing, by the way, shout out to Michael Domagala. He had a hell of a day kicking the football. Yeah, and good. that was, you know, a spot where going into that game, I'm like, okay, the Alouettes definitely have the better kicker. But, you know, Domagala, I thought, you know, was was kicking the ball confidently for, for once because he, I, I said so many times when he was the kicker early on in the season, I said, even when he makes kicks, I'm like, that didn't look very confident. And it was different. It was different yesterday. Uh, you know, the ball was, you know, coming out with some pop and it was going through the uprights right down the middle. And it was like, okay, okay. I see, I see you, Micah Damagala. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Last two things I'll say about this game. Uh, one, there was a dude 10, ro- uh, 10 rows in front of me who created a gray cup out of snow, uh, which was super cool. It wasn't life-size. It was, you know, it was about a foot and a half, two feet tall, but he was actually like carving it with his hands during the game and trying to create the gray cup so that he could have it. And, uh, and it looked pretty good. So congratulations to him. And two, my last observation from watching from the stands, Hamilton leads the history of professional sports when it comes to jerseys that make you go, huh? <laughs> Like people, I saw jerseys yesterday. Uh, of course, you always see the Jason Moss yellow jersey. You always see the Stalas. <laughs> you always see. I saw an old man with a ponytail yesterday wearing a Garney Henley jersey, uh, which was super badass. But I was like, as like, a man, lifer, I was like that. People are not going to understand. Maybe it was. Maybe it was. Uh, what's his name uh, that called into us? Was it Frank? Uh, I'm trying to think of like the post game call that we had. Uh, where the dude called in and gave us that great story. Was uh, that 2017? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Uh, I don't know if I can find it right here. Sorry, just let me apologize by playing for you. Uh, Julian Hauser saying his own name. Here we go. 
There you go. Uh, I'll just apologize because that's the only thing I can find right now on the fly. Uh, but I saw a Garney Henley jersey. I saw that. And then I also saw jerseys where people had like customized and put their own name on the back of the uniform, which is cool, like doing your own thing. But then I saw a Braylon Addison jersey that was very obviously not from the Ticats store. Somebody had <laughs> bought somebody had bought a blank Ticats jersey and then taken it somewhere to get screen printed 86 Addison onto the jersey. I'm like, they they do that for you if you want, like, and it looks like the jersey that's on the field. I'm like, it, there's just so many jerseys when you're at a Ticats game where you're like, you, that's that's weird. Why did you do that? That's oh, you like that? Oh, Markeith Knowlton. Weird. I haven't seen one of those in a while. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> just random players. It's the funniest thing, just wandering around there and seeing. But anyways, uh, let's get to this Western final before we uh, wrap things up because we, uh, you know, we got lives. Uh, and so the first thing I want to ask you, Kyle is where where do you think Saskatchewan fans should have confidence going into Winnipeg? Because I have, to, I have to write an article today on CFL.ca about who has the early advantage or looking at positional groups specifically. And I was trying to think on the GO train this morning, what's the positional group that I can go into this game confidently saying Saskatchewan is better than Winnipeg? And offensive line, no, it's Winnipeg. Defensive line might be the best case because Jonathan Woodard has been great, Micah Johnson, A.C. Leonard. But no, it's Willie Jefferson, Jackson Jeffcoat, uh, Stephen Richardson. Like, they've, they've got the advantage at that point. Linebackers, Deion Lacey's great. Adam Big Hill's better, or at least more effective at this point. And, and it's not one versus one, but it's just the extent of their roster. Defensive backfield, DeAndre Alford has been fantastic. Um, are, I mean, better than Nick Marshall in coverage. They've got Ed Ganey back there, Luchez Purifoy, all the rest for the Riders. But, I mean, Brandon Alexander's CFL All-Star free safety coming downhill. So it's like, it's not DBs, it's not linebackers, it's not the kicking game at this point is like, well, Sergio Castillo's just basically arrived, but he's better at his best than I think what they're putting out there for anything else. Uh, as I said, it's not offensive line. It's not quarterback at this point because Kalaros is going to be the MOP. Is it receiver? Like, can you make the argument? Because it's not running back. No. I mean, it, as long as Andrew Harris is in, even if he's not, Brady Oliveira has been pretty good. So I think that's a bit of a draw. Like, I don't know where the advantage is for the riders in this one. And I don't want to make, I think this is going to be the annoying narrative to fans that wear green in Western Canada throughout this week is going to be, you have no chance. You have no chance. There's going to be articles written in every newspaper and every online place saying, Here's how the regular season went. It really defined the difference between these two teams. It was a beatdown. Saskatchewan's coming off a game where Cody Fajardo throws four interceptions and finds a way, a way to win. And like, it's just going to be relentless with people saying, hey, Riders, you have no chance. You have no chance. You have no chance. And the thing is, it's the Riders' job, and it's Craig Dickinson's job this week, to force them to block that the hell out. Because they, <laughs> they cannot – they have a – less than 0% chance of winning this game if they go in listening to that and believing even the slightest hint of it. They have to have blind arrogance going into Winnipeg believing that they can get this thing done because if they if they go in with an inkling of, I don't know, man, this year was it was tough and Winnipeg's better and there's no chance at that point. Ooh, so by the way, shout out to the stupidity of football um, that Always. two that two teams yesterday won football games with their quarterback throwing four interceptions because Saskatchewan did it and the Baltimore Ravens did it. <laughs> Lamar Jackson chucking four interceptions last night against the Browns and uh, they still win the game. Why? Because they're playing the Browns. The Browns. Um, this game, you know, I've been very critical this year of Cody Fajardo and the lack of production that he you know puts up. I think other than the four interceptions, and again, that's a huge other than, um, you know, Cody Fajardo almost 90 yards rushing and, and a touchdown. He's going to have to have, especially if William Powell can't really get it going and the offensive line can't really protect or can't really, uh, you know, uh, you know, make a dent in trying to run the football. Um, he's going to have to, you know, gain yards on the ground for the riders to be successful. Now, can he do that against Winnipeg remains to be seen as for, you know, this game, you mentioned, you know, if you're the riders, what strength do you have? Special teams, I, I think you you know are probably always one of the premier teams in the Canadian Football League. And you know, next week in in the West Final, 
it's going to come down to two guys that, you know, special teams lives in their blood, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. Mike O'Shea and, uh, and Craig Dickinson and, you know, for Craig Dickinson, um, it, it's funny because you go and get Duke Williams and we think that there's all of a sudden a new aspect to the Riders' offense. Didn't didn't happen yesterday. His longest completion was to Alexander Dupuis, the fullback, and it was a crazy play by Fajardo, you know, to get away from pressure. Um, I don't know what it is, and maybe we haven't, you know, pointed it out enough. the The protection of the for for the Riders is not great. Cody Fajardo's on 40, the run for his life. They gave up forty sacks this year. Calgary gave up twenty. Now I know that that Saskatchewan called more passing plays, which is going to lead to more sacks and more pressures. But to give up twice as many going against a team in the playoffs is crazy to me. So yeah, I'm I'm with you on that because that that's a little bit scary. By the way, that I was listening on CKRM, listening to Derek Taylor call the game on my drive home, um, and it was late third quarter by the time that I got out of Tim Hortons Field, and he described the Alexander Dupuis hurdle on that play <laughs> as if he had just cleared the Empire State Building. Uh, <laughs> and it made me laugh because I watched back the game when I got home and I'm like, he high stepped. I'm like, the guy went low and oh, he just kind yeah. of like hopped a little bit and kicked, kicked the feet over the top. This was not Josh Allen, like balls to the face of a Minnesota Vikings linebacker <laughs> hurdling. Like there's a no. difference between those two things. But I did find it kind of funny because I, I love DT and I love listening to him call games. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it, for me, I, I have a hard time finding anywhere that Saskatchewan should feel like they have a very real advantage in this one. Uh, I thought for Jardo and the called running game, I expected to see. Um, I haven't crunched the numbers on it yet to see if it was actually above average for their season. I believe that it was. Uh, by the way, just to throw it back real, really quickly here, the other thing I'm going to crunch the numbers on today uh, is looking at Montreal and what they did with their two-back set. I just thought that was really interesting, that they essentially simplified the game and said, we're going to go two by two by two, like two receivers in Quan Bray, Reggie White, two receivers in yeah. Winicky and uh, and Gino Lewis. And we're going to go in the backfield with either Spencer Moore and Stanback or Stanback and Cameron Arnold's Payne or Stanback and um, Christophe Normand, the other fullback. And they were mixing and matching those packages, but it was pretty consistent. And there was a lot of just throwing out of seven man protection in that two by two by two set. And I was like, that they haven't done very much of that this year. So that, that was a bit of a strange game plan to me, but anyways, that was, that was the Eastern game. We already covered enough. I just wanted to mention that I found that was interesting. Uh, but yeah, the Western game, I mean, if Bo, Bo's comments after the game were pretty interesting, Kyle, I don't know how much or any of them that you caught, but he essentially said, that I need some time to assess my body and make sure that I'm feeling okay going forward yeah. here. And, uh, and Dave Dickinson, when I was asked about Bo coming back next year, said that's more on Bo than us. Like I want to coach Bo. I want him to be back. And then Bo said he wants to be more like himself. If he's going to come back, he wants to feel more like himself. And I forget what the actual framing of the question was, but somebody said something like, you don't feel like you were yourself. And he, and he snapped back. Did I look like myself? And it was like, ooh, that's pretty self-aware by Bo to just be like, I don't mind telling you guys that I feel like I was not up to par for the way I expect myself to play. And you all saw it. So, like, don't act like you didn't see it. Mm -hmm. um, which was also kind of interesting because Trevor Harris was asked in the post-game presser in Hamilton uh, a question of, did you think that your 300-plus receiving uh, passing yards were uh, misleading? <laughs> Trevor just goes, I don't even know what that means. Yeah. Well, uh, who <laughs> like, asked that question? It was Herb. Uh, <laughs> Herb always asks the questions that make people just go, hey, what? What are you doing? Uh, love you, Herb. Uh, anyways, so the, I guess the conundrum here for Saskatchewan is where do you find the advantages? Because your margin for victory is very, very small against a very talented and favored in the betting lines Winnipeg Blue Bombers team. Ah, uh, man. Uh, <laughs> you're struggling to muster the energy to make the argument for Saskatchewan. <laughs> no, because I'm trying to see if the Calgary Stampeders can move forward with Bo. Oh, okay. Because, yeah. Because um, if you're the Stampeders, I think this season was kind of a punch in the face to the identity that you've had yeah. over the last decade. And that was with Bo. In terms of this game, look, when the opposing quarterback throws four interceptions, you should win the game. Their inability to you know put the ball in the end zone really hurt them. Um, you know they were 
trying field goals, Rene Paredes, and obviously missed three field goals, uh, field goal attempts on the day. Um, Kadeem Carey had a good day running the football. Um, there was one play, and I think it was at the end of regulation. So, you know, riders go up by three, stamps get the football. I think the stamps were inside the 30 yard line. It was second and three. And run the ball with Kadeem Carey, and they drop back to pass the football, and Bo gets sacked. Now, Rene Perida still made the kick, but on second and three, give it to your best player, and your best player on the day, and your best player this season has been Kadeem Carey. Um, so I didn't understand that play call from Dave Dickinson. Uh, you know, as for you know the the Riders, offensively, you have to find an ability to stretch the defense because we always talk about this when you're not pushing the ball foot down the football field. Even if you're not successful in doing so, you shrink the danger area for the defense. And when you shrink it, well, it's going to be harder to hit those areas that you're working in because you're not, you know, stretching the defense. And I find too many times, and I think it is drawn up by the offensive play calling, where it's like, Cody Fajardo, and it could be a lack of protection, and you know they're worried about Fajardo getting sacked and, and things like that. Fajardo, I find it's like, okay, slant, okay, uh, comeback route, and it's like it's all short of the sticks. If you're going to do this, defense are just going to sit at the sticks and say, okay, you can complete you know 30 passes today, but at the end of the day, you're going to have like 210 yards passing. Like we don't care if you're completing five yard passes. We'll make the tackle and we'll move on with our lives. Um, for Fajardo, you know, you talked about, you know, the inability to catch jump balls and, you know, pushing the ball down the field and you, you know, felt your receivers needed to do a better job. You need to give your receivers a chance as well. And I just did, I, I thought in this game, and again, it could be the context of what was happening on the field. I didn't think Fajardo was giving, you know, his receivers a chance. I thought he was, you know, first read ball out five yard completion. And it's like, okay, if you want to do that against the bombers, but it's not going to, it's not going to go well for you. Like you have to be able to make big plays and you're going to need big plays. And for the riders at, at times this year, they've been trailing in games and then they try to turn it on where it's like, okay, now we have to push the ball down the field and it doesn't go well for Fajardo. And it's like, well, eventually that has to start happening at the beginning of the football game. Yeah, yeah. It'd be nice to see them get off to a quick start and at least put some pressure on Winnipeg in this Western final and just and just see how the Bombers respond to it because they haven't felt much of that throughout this season. Uh, I mean, down the stretch, yeah, but those were throwaway games that they weren't really invested in, I think, yeah. wholeheartedly. So they're going to be rested, they're going to be prepared, and, uh, and they're going to have a good opportunity to make their way to Hamilton for the Great Cup. My last couple of thoughts on the, the Western semifinal. Sean Lemon, just one of the dumbest things I've seen in recent history. Like, just taking three, four steps at halftime as teams are ready to go into the tunnel, punching Duke Williams in the face. When, like, if Duke Williams said something bad enough to deserve getting punched in the face, he would have been ejected from the game for, like, slander, essentially, because the CFL does have a mandate on that. But Sean Lemon just took something super defensively and takes two or three steps, punches him, and it's like, okay, now one of your best defensive ends is out in a game where you need a pass rush and you need contain to try and work with Cody Fajardo as he's running all over yeah. the place. It's, like it's the you, ultimate selfish move. You hurt your team in a very tangible way by just being a straight-up idiot if you're Sean Lemon in that spot. So that was not great. And then the other thing that if I would have gone into this game predicting something that I, I felt I knew 100%, that I could guarantee to people, it would be that the kickers would be on point. Mm -hmm. Holy, that was not the case. Like, no. <laughs> like if we would have gone into yesterday and said Michael Domigal is going to look a lot better than Rennie Parrott is today, you'd be like, shut up. Like based <laughs> on what we based on what we've seen this season. But it's true. At the end of the day, it's true. That's what that ended up looking like in between those two games. I was stunned. The one in overtime obviously hurts, but it's the ones earlier in the game where there is no pressure where Paradis is just, you be, you come to understand he's so incredibly automatic. It's the same thing as Lewis Ward. Like, Lewis Ward hits a billion kicks in a row, and the first time that he misses one, or two in a row, or three out of his last five, everyone's like, he's broken. I'm like, no, he's human. And, like, Rene's human, and he had a very human day. But he hasn't been human for, like, a decade. And that's where the unrealistic standard is set for him, because he's been so good. So... He, yeah. is, he is punished by his own greatness on the biggest stage of the year. Yeah. Um, but for the Stamps, I mean, yes, you have a veteran kicker that you trust, but I thought they just relied on 
kicking the football for field goals far too often. Um, whether it was second and short and a bad play happened, and then obviously bring Parrot is out. Um, missing the kick in overtime, it was really close. Um, he kind of pulled it. Um, but the one at the end of what was it, regulation, um, he hugged he hugged the upright and then was able to creep it back in. Um, so I was surprised there. Cause I always talk about, you know, making kicks confidently, <laughs> even that kick, I was like, Ooh, I don't think Renee has it today. Um, because he thought, you know, when the ball went up in the air that he was going to miss the kick and then it, you know, crept in and, you know, for the stamps, it, it sucks because you do have so much trust in Paradis. Um, I always say for, for kickers and I'm talking about good kickers, It's the same thing about the NBA and field goals, right? A guy could be a 90% free throw shooter. And in the NBA finals in game seven, he misses free throws. The guy didn't get to choose when he missed his 10 field goals out of a hundred attempts, right? He doesn't get to choose that. You know, sometimes it just doesn't go his way for Rene Paradis. He's a great kicker, but he is going to miss at times. He just doesn't get to choose when those are going to happen. It all happened in the same game. And it sucks if you're a Stamps fan. Um, you know, but moving forward, that guy is still a very good kicker. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Uh, the last thing I got for you here on this game is that Cody Fajardo throws those four interceptions and he still ends up being able to get the win, as we said. And post game, he said uh, something to the tune of there was a whole dollop of Jesus uh, that helped him get through the <laughs> game, which is one of the most amazing sentences I've ever heard. But then I started thinking afterwards, I remember a game in which Cody Fajardo talked about sprinkles of Jesus. Uh, and it was actually week 15 of this year uh, where it was referenced in an article online talking about uh, sprinkles of Jesus, as Fajardo calls them, allowed the Riders to not only clinch a home playoff game in their 29-24 win over Montreal, blah, 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 but there's also references uh, from 2019. August 2nd, 2019. Fajardo writes happy ending. Uh, Fajardo writes happy ending to Riders game with, quote, a little sprinkle of Jesus. So my question at this point, inevitably, Kyle, is going to become, how many sprinkles, how many sprinkles of Jesus equal a dollop? (laughs) Like, is that like, uh, is that like two or three teaspoons to a tablespoon? Like, what is the ratio of sprinkle to dollop? And I also wonder what's between sprinkles and dollops of jesus like what is there another metric that's in between and i guess the final thought is how many dollops does cody fajardo need in the western final because he doesn't (laughs) he doesn't need sprinkles of jesus i I don't think or is a sprinkle of jesus actually worth more than a dollop because we don't actually know the scale yeah um I'll say this, uh, Fajardo better uh, get a trunk load of uh, dollops when he heads to Winnipeg <laughs> for, for, for that game uh, because uh, he's going to need it. Um, in terms of, you know, chucking four interceptions in a playoff game is pretty crazy. Um, for Fajardo, at some point, you have to find <laughs> – what's up? Sorry, I was just loving – I don't know if I was the only one who could actually hear the angel music, but um, I was loving – hearing you uh give serious football analysis over like heavenly music just harps, <laughs> harpsichords playing could you hear that at all no i didn't hear that oh okay great it didn't play on your end then okay i'll put it in a post <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know for for Jardo, there's got to come a point where you really shine when push comes to shove and i put it out in cf perspective because you know, I took the riders in the game minus two and a half, but the reasoning for it was actually no reasoning at all. It was more of a feeling. And I put that in the article. I said, I think this is a feeling bet more than anything. The minus two and a half, because I'm like, the riders can't lose back to back playoff games in Riderville. Can they? They almost did. And it was thanks to their quarterback chucking four interceptions, but he has to shine at some point in order to. It, it seems to me, and, and I've, I've gotten so much hate on Twitter from Riders fans when I criticize Cody Fajardo. Weird. I'm like, that never happened. are you seeing the production? Like the last two years, his production is not great. Maybe this is what he is. Um, 
But to go in a playoff game and throw four interceptions, and it wasn't like, oh, I threw the ball over the middle and I went through the receiver's hands and the ball went up in the air. No. What I'm talking about before was when you're not pushing down the ball down the field, you shrink the window that the defense has to operate in. And that's what they were doing. It was all underneath throws that were getting jumped by receivers. Now I hear the uh, Angel Heart music. <laughs> Is this, is this going to help uh, Cody Fajardo with his uh, dollops of Jesus? This is actually what he plays in his headphones to get him fired up pregame. <laughs> yeah. I'm just imagining that like somebody's like, like at Riders game day operations. Guys, we're doing a, a feature this year where we put up your favorite songs uh, onto the Jumbotron and we say like, it's time now for the Spotify Pick Your Playlist brought to you by da 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 Today, it's Cody Fajardo, and here's his favorite jam that he gets pumped up to pregame. Uh, yeah, he better bring all of the dollops, though. I agree. Yeah. You know what? We're going to do an old-fashioned marshmallow poll. It's going to go up there on uh, on our at marshmallow handle. How many dollops of Jesus does Cody Fajardo need for this weekend? Um, Truckload. Is, is a sprinkle worth more than a dollop? How many sprinkles equal a dollop? Um, but I would also say, Kyle, that because he is a, a good-looking young man, a family man, a God-fearing man, uh, living in the prairies, slinging the rock around, uh, criticizing him makes you directly the devil. <laughs> in the eyes of many Riders fans. So, so don't Does he have go a into... Tim Tebow syndrome? Uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing that Tebow... Because like, I know that there's a lot of religion at various points in Florida, but it's like, I don't know. Jacksonville doesn't seem like the holiest place to me personally, or Gainesville, I should yeah. say. Not even, I mean, he was in Jacksonville for a cup of tea, but anyways. But uh, for me, like, like <laughs> the, the criticism of Cody Fajardo, it is valid. And yes. for writers fans to protect, you know, the sanctity of their quarterback, it they're blows not, my mind because you think it's you think it would be like criticizing Michael Riley, right? This year for the BC Lions, it's like you know Michael Riley needs to be a lot better for the Lions, and then somebody coming on and saying you know oh Michael Riley's a legend, which he is, but the, Cody Fajardo's not that. Like he hasn't accomplished a ton in the Canadian Football League. He's also in relatively of, early on, but yeah, I agree. Yeah, and, and I'm talking about like in, in terms of winning, and again, 2019 is so unfair to criticize Cody Fajardo because he was injured in that game, but as far as I know, he was healthy yesterday, and he threw four interceptions. Now, when push came to shove, he did you know make enough plays to, to win the football game. Um, you know, Obviously, it was a huge opportunity when Rene Paredes missed that field goal in overtime because now, oh, you just have to score, and then they go two and out, and Lawther comes on and, and you know wins the game for them. Um, but but for the Riders now you're heading into Winnipeg. This is, this is a different beast, and you know it's 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 not the Stampeders. Um, and, you know, and Zach Kalaros at, at points this year. By the way, Zach Kalaros is probably going to win the MOP yeah. um, over William Stanback. And you know, credit to to Stanback, he had a hell of a season. Um, didn't really have a great day yesterday. Um, but by the way, did you vote this year on on yep. CFL awards? Yep. Um, and CFL All Stars. Mm -hmm. Um. There were some names in CFL All Stars. I'm like, man, I just feel like there's a lot of incumbents there, incumbent names. I'm like, I don't think that guy had a fantastic yeah. season. Look, I love Chris Van Zyl. Was Chris Van Zyl the best right tackle in the East Division, well, in the Canadian if, Football League? If you look, I think I had him as like my second best or third best in the East. But if you look at it, it's like I would take him over Tony Washington, who I think of as a marquee tackle for the Montreal Alouettes. The marquee... He got left yesterday by Jagarry Davis on that spin move. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the I'm trying to think, like, who's the standout locked-in tackle that played for Ottawa this year? There isn't one. No, no. And then you start looking at Toronto, and it's like, oh, I, would take, I would take Van Zyl over Jamal Campbell. Like based yeah. on like honestly his experience and and I get what you're saying like name brand notoriety does count sometimes I see the awards come out and I'm like I don't know what everybody else was voting voting for but <laughs> um when when you actually do a team by team breakdown of the best tackles I think Van Zyl has a case to to be included in the top two which is really all that all star voting situation is but uh, let me close a loop here on why Riders fans might be irrational when it comes to Cody Fajardo it actually ties into religion okay. <laughs> I, I just looked up the definition of fanatic, which is when people say, like, I'm a diehard Riders fan. What they're really saying is, like, short form for fanatic. 
And fanatic is a noun. It means a person filled with excessive and single-minded zeal, especially for an extreme religious or political cause. It can also be used as an adjective, filled with or expressing excessive zeal. Quote, his fanatic energy. That is fanatic, F-A-N-A-T. I see. <laughs> get ready, get ready. Let's go, a little urgency. Here we go. Let's go. We're almost out of here. This is the three minute warning brought to you by. Brought to you by the Great Cup party that Kyle Mello doesn't even know that we're having yet. And no, I'm no, about- I know. I watched your uh, thing with DT. Uh, I was going to say, I'm about I to. I do invite- pay attention to the Canadian Football Perspective uh, <laughs> podcast. I was about to say, I'm about to invite Kyle Mello live on air to a party he doesn't know that he's going to be part of. Uh, Great Cup Sunday. Today, the uh, all things three-minute warning is brought to you, of course, by Fox 40. Make sure you're going to fox40shop.com to be able to, uh, to support our big, big friends at Fox 40. Great job, by the way, Dave Foxcroft of calling the Western uh, semifinal. I thought it was very well officiated um, and Dave always does a great job on the microphone as well, just keeping the, the flow of the game moving and, and uh, being really smooth but uh, I also would say uh, that Sada City has been such an incredible partner for us at CFB throughout the year and because of our partnership with them, we've been able to create this relationship with Merritt Brewing and so 1 to 3 p.m. on Grey Cup Sunday we are going to be throwing a little shindig. And Kyle, you and I, I think, are going to get together and do a podcast on Grey Cup Sunday, if possible, at like noon uh, down there. I just want to pump out like a on the scene at Merritt hangout, uh, have a couple of beers, and uh, we're going to hopefully get the guys from Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily to come over. We're going to get some prizes. We're going to do some trivia on social media through the Merritt Brewing handle. Uh, we got all sorts of fun stuff that's going to be up. And we've got uh, the projector screen that's going to be up at Merritt as well with the Grey Cup Sunday pregame show, and the sound will be on of that with a little bit of music bumping around as well. It's a great venue. Look it up, Merit Brewing. And uh, and again, our thanks to Fox 40 and Sada City for helping get us to this point and create some of these kind of uh, alternative relationships that we can hang out with these other great people that love football and want to be involved in all things Canadian football perspective. So uh, are you looking forward to that? I think it's going to be fun. Look, looking forward to it. Uh, I was excited when uh, you were telling DT about it. Is DT going to be, uh, even if the riders don't make it, is DT going to be in uh, Hamilton? I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. I think he'll probably be there on Radio Row doing his thing in the last couple of days, if there is a Radio Row. I COVID, I have no idea what anything looks like this year whatsoever, yeah. but um, I hope he's going to be there. I hope the guys from Winnipeg come in. We'll get, uh, we're we're going to pull as many people that you know from the CFL world to come and hang out with us from 1 to 3 p.m. over at Merritt Brewing on Great Cup Sunday. So Sadly, uh, because of the events of February 9th when uh, we all got we all got hacked, <laughs> um, Radio Row is now Radio what, Corner? Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's now podcast from a brewery. I think is is what we've now turned Radio Row into. On, it's like uh, three stations that existed in 2019. Uh, their radio tent uh, no longer exists. We've gone digital, baby. Uh, yeah. But yeah, should be should be a fun day, and I hope that you'll all come out and hang out and have some beers and have some fun with us. Uh, by the way, we specifically decided to counter program the seventy five dollar cover charge of the Tie Cats pregame tailgate. The hell is that? <laughs> Who has $75 to spend that doesn't even include the ticket to go to the game? And you know the way it is, right? Uh, you know, great cup parties. You walk in, you walk out. You walk in, you get a drink, you walk out. <laughs> so and ours, then you go to another one. Guess how much ours costs? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Any money that you spend there will be on beer for you. Supporting the people who are throwing this party with us on Great Cup Sunday. It's right in downtown Hamilton. It's going to be fantastic. We'll send out more details on it as we get them in the next couple of weeks. Uh, some promotion stuff here coming up on CFP. Uh, my interview with Steph Patatsik is up now on the 2011 Vanier Cup team. That was a super fun conversation. John Behe, offensive coordinator McMaster. That one's going up today. Uh, All Canadian is up. We're going to have a Mitchell Bowl recap because I called that game over on the weekend. and uh, Or I called the UTEC Bowl. I should say. Actually, you know what? I meant to play the call of the... Let's just end the actual show here with my call of the UTEC Bowl. By the way, the magic of TV of you calling a game on a screen. (laughs) It's awesome. Uh, Yeah, it was wild. I was calling it from a closet in Mississauga. And, uh, you know, I probably should have gone into just the the hilarity of some of the technical issues we went through. I'll just mention this quickly because it is kind of a funny story, even though I've already wrapped wrapped the podcast. 
little uh, little bonus episode for you here. So we were calling it from a TVR television feed, which means that we're getting like the dirty, dirty feed of, of their video they're sending through. We're, yeah. co- we're covering anything that's like super French or interviews that they were doing on the sidelines with just like visuals of Montreal. <laughs> Problem is at one point we lost our transmission from the truck from TVR. And in my ear, producer Mike Brannigan's like, hey, so we lost the transmission. So just you're going to have to tap dance here a little bit. I'm like, OK. And I start talking about the game. And I had all these notes, obviously, my research. And Who did the game with you? Uh, it was Deshaun Stevens from Persevere. He was awesome. It was, oh. his, it was his first time ever doing a, a game. But so we we battle through all this technical glitch stuff. And it was tough, but I was like, whatever. It's either way, I'm getting paid. It's going to be a fun game. These are two great teams. I'm like, it's. I wish this was cleaner, but it is what it is. So we're calling the game. We're having a fun time with it. We lose transmission. And, and I start tap dancing for 90 seconds. And all they're running is visuals of Montreal. And I felt like I was trying to call a football game over a tourism video. And it was the, it was the weirdest <laughs> feeling in the world where I'm like, Scott Flory, two-time Vanier Cup champion, 1996-1998 with the Huskies, and went on to a fantastic 15-year career. But meanwhile, it was just like the Cleveland tourism video was playing in my mind because it's like, here's a bridge. Here's the downtown. Here's the banks of the St. Lawrence. And I'm just like <laughs> rambling about football until we could get the truck feedback. But anyways, the game ended up being fantastic and it came down to the final seconds. And I will just leave you with the call at the end of the game. Cause I really enjoyed being able to call this one. Uh, it was at this point in the game, for those of you who did not see it on social media, it was Montreal Caravan 10 Saskatchewan seven. There's about eh, 10 seconds left in the game, and the ball is back at the about 10, 12 yard line. My goodness. And yeah. what? Yeah. Here we go. CFL Hall. CFL Hall of Famer. 11 seconds left, second and five. Can he get his team to the Vanier? They'll hand it off. Mackhart cuts it back, looking for the end zone. Touchdown, Huskies, with five seconds remaining. Oh my goodness. And why wow. wouldn't the offensive lineman with the 15 year career in Montreal go to the ground attack in Montreal to try and seal the victory? They've trailed the entire game, but back come the Huskies and hold the lead with five seconds left in the extra point to come. As the passionate owner of a, of a Husky, I've never been so happy to scream touchdown Huskies. <laughs> By the way, um, What's the quarterback's name for the University of Saskatchewan? Uh, it is Mason Nias. I pronounced it Nihus the entire first half. I saw an interview with him after the game. That dude looks like he's 12 years old. <laughs> well, he also he looks like the Prairies is what he looks like to me. Like, but he looks like he's 12 years old. I'm like, is this a high school game? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was really happy, though, Kyle. I was able to dig down into my nether regions and get a little growl on this touchdown call. Yeah. Get his team to the Vanier. They'll hand it off. Mackhart cuts it back, looking for the end zone. Touchdown, Huskies, with five seconds remaining. Yeah, uh, a little growl in there, adding it to the toolbox. Yeah, I know that uh, you've mentioned it before that, you know, the great people at, you know, TSN TV, you know, kind of held your hand through the the cfl season yeah. and you know at times people you know told you you have to pick up the energy a little bit but you just need to tell them maybe the cfl just needs to entertain me more because <laughs> see in that moment i was able to give the emotion exactly there you go you make your games better there's nothing wrong with me yeah guys damn why would you ever criticize me i'm perfect Yes. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Have yourselves a great week. We'll be back next week with a recap uh, of the Eastern and the Western final of who is going to the. Uh, do you have a prediction, Kyle, off the top of your head? Anything? Oh, haven't looked at the lines yet for CF perspective. Um, I'm going to say Toronto Winnipeg.